the Victorian working classes found themselves doing all sorts of horrible jobs to earn money for food and lodging. Many were physically demanding, often filthy, and some downright disgusting. See my videos on the worst Victorian jobs and be surprised just how loathsome work could be. Oftentimes, work was all of this, hard, dirty, and in a time long before health and safety regulations in the workplace, downright dangerous. In the 1840s, the Victorian journalist Henry Mayhew observed and documented the state of working people in London for a series of articles in a newspaper, The Morning Chronicle, that were later compiled into the book London Labour and the London Poor. Mayhew went into great detail about the lives of people living in the city and, importantly, for understanding the brutal reality of what life was really like for the many and not the few in 19th century London. He took the trouble to interview workers driven into some jobs by sheer poverty so that we have a genuine first-hand account of life. He described their clothes, how and where they lived, their entertainments and customs. His account highlights how marginal and precarious many people's lives were in what, at that time, was perhaps the richest city in the world. In this video, you will learn about the hard lives of London's dustmen, with Mayhew's account of their work and conditions. The 1800s was a time when fire heated homes. Millions of tons of ash and refuse had to be removed from the bins and pails of the capital's doorsteps, and, like many jobs in the Victorian era, muck equals money. Hauling ash on carts to yards and sorting the dust for sale was profitable for contractors, but the men at the coalface laboured long hours doing hard physical work. There was certainly no mechanical assistance in these times like modern refuse collectors have today. They were perpetually covered head to toe in grey ash and constantly breathed dust that must have done their health no good at all. If you were a visitor to London in the early years of the 19th century, you would have seen its great dust heaps of collected ash, which are depicted by contemporary artists as monumental mounds of cinders, and even horse bones. The filth and debris of years picked over by many a pig, like the heap that once stood on Caledonian Road. In time, they were sold for development, and the ash that found its way to these disgraceful-looking mounds reappeared in dust yards further east. Dustmen collected the dust from homes, whilst women and children, often families, toiled alongside men in the stinking dust yards sieving the ash to remove any refuse that could be sold on and separating the dust by coarseness for other industries. This wretched job was from cradle to grave. So it's no wonder that men and women relieved their terrible existence with drink in public houses at any and all opportunity, and you will hear genuine conversations recorded by Mayhew with dustmen and dustyard workers to bring alive the hard stories of their impoverished existence. Before we move on, please consider clicking the subscribe button for more content like this. If you find this video interesting, I would really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up and share it widely with friends and family. Please check out the description to see how you can support the channel and the content we make. Dust and rubbish accumulate in houses from a variety of causes, but principally from the residuum of fires. The white ash and cinders, or small fragments of unconsumed coke, giving rise to by far the greater quantity. Some notion of the vast amount of this refuse annually produced in London may be formed from the fact that the consumption of coal in the metropolis is, according to the official returns, 3,500,000 tons per annum which is at the rate of a little more than 11 tons per house. The poorer families, it is true, do not burn more than two tons in the course of the year, but then many such families reside in the same house, and hence the average will appear in no way excessive. Now the ashes and cinders arising from this enormous consumption of coal would, it is evident, if allowed to lie scattered about in such a place as London, render ere long not only the back streets, but even the important thoroughfares, filthy and impassable. 
upon the officers of the various parishes, therefore, has devolved the duty of seeing that the refuse of the fuel consumed throughout London is removed almost as fast as produced. This they do by entering into an agreement for the clearance of the dust bins of the parishioners as often as required with some person who possesses all necessary appliances for the purpose, such as horses, carts, baskets, and shovels, together with a plot of waste ground whereon to deposit the refuse. The persons with whom this agreement is made are called dust contractors, and are generally men of considerable wealth. The collection of dust is now, more properly speaking, the removal of it. The collection of an article implies the voluntary seeking after it, and this the dustmen, employed by the contractors, can hardly be said to do, for though they parade the streets shouting for the dust as they go, they do so rather to fulfil a certain duty they have undertaken to perform than in any expectation of profit to be derived from the sale of the article. Formerly the custom was otherwise, but then the residuum of the London fuel was far more valuable. Demand has fallen off greatly, while the supply has been progressively increasing, owing to the extension of the metropolis, so that the contractors have not only declined paying anything for liberty to collect it, but now stipulate to receive a certain sum for the removal of it. The dustmen are, generally speaking, an hereditary race. When children, they are reared in the dustyard, and are habituated to the work gradually as they grow up, after which, almost as a natural consequence, they follow the business for the remainder of their lives. These may be said to be born and bred dustmen. The numbers of the regular men are, however, from time to time, recruited from the ranks of the many ill-paid labourers, with which London abounds. When hands are wanted for any special occasion, an employer has only to go to any of the dock gates, to find at all times hundreds of starving wretches, anxiously watching for the chance of getting something to do, even at the rate of four pence per hour, as the operation of emptying a dustbin requires only the ability to handle a shovel, which every labouring man can manage. All workmen, however unskilled, can at once engage in the occupation, and it often happens that the men thus casually employed remain at the calling for the remainder of their lives. The manner in which the dust is collected is very simple. The filler and the carrier perambulate the streets with a heavily built high box cart, which is mostly coated with a thick crust of filth and drawn by a clumsy-looking horse. These men used, before the passing of the late street act, to ring a dull-sounding bell, so as to give notice to housekeepers of their approach. But now they merely cry, in a hoarse, on musical voice, Dustoye! Two men accompany the cart, which is furnished with a short ladder, and two shovels and baskets. These baskets one of the men fills from the dustbin, and then helps them alternately, as fast as they are filled upon the shoulder of the other man, who carries them one by one to the cart, which is placed immediately alongside the pavement in front of the house where they are at work. The carrier mounts up the side of the cart by means of the ladder, discharges into it the contents of the basket on his shoulder, and then returns below for the other basket which his mate has filled for him in the interim. This process is pursued till all is cleared away, and repeated at different houses till the cart is fully loaded. Then the men make the best of their way to the dust yard, where they shoot the contents of the cart onto the heap, and again proceed on their regular rounds. The dustmen, in their appearance, very much resemble the wagoners of the coal merchants. They generally wear knee breeches with ankle boots or gaiters, short dirty smock frocks or coarse grey jackets and fantail hats. In one particular, however, they are at first sight distinguishable from the coal merchant's men, for the latter are invariably black from coal dust, while the dust men, on the contrary, are grey with ashes. In their personal appearance the dust men are mostly tall, stalwart fellows. There is nothing sickly looking about them, and yet a considerable part of their time is passed in the yards, and in the midst of effluvia most offensive, and, if we believe, zemotic theorists as unhealthy to those unaccustomed to them. Nevertheless, the children who may be said to be reared in the yard, and to have inhaled the stench of the dust heap with their first breath, are healthy and strong. 
It is said, moreover, that during the plague in London, the dustmen were the persons who carted away the dead, and it remains a tradition among the class to the present day that not one of them died of the plague, even during its greatest ravages. In Paris, too, it is well known that during the cholera of 1849, the quarter of Belleville, where the night soil and refuse of the city is deposited, escaped from the pestilence. And in London, the dustmen boast that during both the recent visitations of the cholera, they were altogether exempt from the disease. Look at that fellow, sir said one of the dust contractors to me, pointing to his son, who was a stout, red-cheeked young man of about twenty. Do you see anything ailing about him? Well, he has been in the yard since he was born. There stands my house, just at the gate. So, you see, he hadn't far to travel, and when quite a child, he used to play and root away here among the dust all his time. I don't think he ever had a day's illness in his life. The people about the yard are all used to the smell and don't complain about it. It's all stuff and nonsense, all this talk about dust yards being unhealthy. I've never done anything else in my days, and I don't think I look very ill. <laughs> I shouldn't wonder now, but what I'd be set down as being fresh from the seaside by those very fellows that write all this trash about a matter they don't know just that about. And he snapped his fingers contemptuously in the air, and, thrusting both hands into his breeches' pockets, strutted about, apparently satisfied that he had the best of the argument. He was, in fact, a stout, jolly, red-faced man. Indeed, the dustmen, as a class, appeared to be healthy, strong men, and extraordinary instances of longevity are common among them. I heard of one dustman who lived to be 115 years. Another, named Wood, died at 100. And the well-known Richard Terrell died only a short time back at the advanced age of 97. The misfortune is that we have no large series of facts on this subject, so that the longevity and health of the dustmen might be compared with those of other classes. In almost all of their habits, the dustmen are similar to the costermongers, with the exception that they seem to want their cunning and natural quickness, and that they have little or no predilection for gaming. Very few of them understand cards, and I could not learn that they ever play at pitch and toss. I remarked, however, a number of parallel lines such as are used for playing shove halfpenny on a deal table in the tap room frequented by them. The great amusement of their evening seems to be to smoke as many pipes of tobacco and drink as many pots of beer as possible. I believe it will be found that all persons in the habit of driving horses, such as cabmen, busmen, stagecoach drivers, etc., are peculiarly partial to intoxicating drinks. The cause of this I leave others to determine, merely observing that there would seem to be two reasons for it. The first is their frequent stopping at public houses to water or change their horses, so that the idea of drinking is repeatedly suggested to their minds, even if the practice be not expected of them. While the second reason is that being out continually in the wet, they resort to stimulating liquors as a preventative to colds, until at length a habit of drinking is formed. Moreover, from the mere fact of passing continually through the air, they are enabled to drink a greater quantity with comparative impunity. Be the cause, however, what it may, the dustmen spend a large proportion of their earnings in drink. There is always some public house in the neighbourhood of the dust yard, where they obtain credit from one week to another, and here they may be found every night, from the moment their work is done, drinking and smoking their long pipes, their principal amusement consisting in chaffing each other. This chaffing consists of a species of scurrilous joke supposed to be given and taken in good part, and the noise and uproar occasioned thereby increases as the night advances, and as the men get heated with liquor, sometimes the joking ends in a general quarrel. The next morning, however, they are all as good friends as ever, and mutually agree in laying the blame on the cussed drink. One half, at least, of the dustmen's earnings is, I am assured, expended in drink, both man and woman assisting in squandering their money in this way. They associate with none but themselves, and in the public houses where they resort, there is a room set apart for the special use of the dusties, as they are called, where no others are allowed to intrude except introduced by one of themselves, or at the special desire of the majority of the party. 
and on such occasions, the stranger is treated with great respect and consideration. They usually live in rooms for which they pay from one shilling sixpence to two shillings per week rent, three or four dustmen and their wives frequently lodging in the same house. These rooms are cheerless-looking and almost unfurnished, and are always situated in some low street or lane not far from the dust yard. The men have rarely any clothes but those in which they work. For their breakfast, the dustmen on their rounds mostly go to some cheap coffee house, where they get a pint or half pint of coffee, taking their bread with them as a matter of economy. Their midday meal is taken in the public house, and is almost always bread and cheese and beer, or else a saveloy or a piece of fat pork or bacon, and at night they mostly wind up by deep potations at their favourite house of call. There are many dustmen, now advanced in years, born and reared at the east end of London, who have never, in the whole course of their lives, been so far west as Temple Bar, who know nothing whatever of the affairs of the country, and who have never attended a place of worship. Among twenty men whom I met in one yard, there were only five who could read, and only two out of that five could write, even imperfectly. These two are looked up to by their companions as prodigies of learning, and are listened to as oracles, on all occasions being believed to understand every subject thoroughly. It need hardly be added, however, that their requirements are of the most meagre character. The dustmen are very partial to a song, and always prefer one of the doggerel street ballads, with what they call a jolly chorus, in which during their festivities they all join with stentorian voices. At the conclusion, there is usually a loud stamping of feet and rattling of quart pots on the table, expressive of their approbation. The dustmen never frequent the twopenny hops, but sometimes make up a party for the theatre. They generally go in a body with their wives, if married, and their gals, if single. They are always to be found in the gallery, and greatly enjoy the melodramas performed at the second-class minor theatres, especially if there be plenty of murdering scenes in them. The Garrick, previously to its being burnt, was a favourite resort of the East End dustmen. Since that period they have patronised the Pavilion and the City of London. As for the morals of these people, it may easily be supposed that they are not of um, an over-strict character. One of the contractors said to me, I just trust one of them as far as I could fling a bull by the tail. But then, he added, with a callousness that proved the laxity of discipline among the men was due more to his neglect of his duty to them than from any other special perversity on their parts. That's none of my business. They do my work, and that's all I want with them, and all I care about. You see, they're not like other people. They're real to it. Their fathers before them were dustmen, and when lads, they go into the yard as sifters, and when they grow up, they take up the shovel and go out with the carts. They learn all they know in the dust yards, and you may judge from that what their learning is likely to be. If they find anything among the dust, you may be sure that neither you nor I will ever hear anything about it. Ignorant as they are, they know a little too much for that. They know, as well as here and there one, where the dolly shop is. But, as I said before, that's none of my business. Let everyone look out for themselves, as I do, and then they need not care for anyone. With such masters professing such principles, though it should be stated that the sentiments expressed on this occasion are but similar to what I hear from the lower class of traders every day, how can it be expected that these poor fellows can be above the level of the mere beasts of burdens that they use? As for the women, continued the master, I don't trouble my head about such things. I believe the dustmen are as good to them as other men, and I'm sure their wives would be as good as other women, if they only had the chance of the best. But you see, they're all such fellows for drink that they spend most of their money that way, and then starve the poor women and knock them about at a shocking rate, so that they have the life of dogs, or worse. I don't wonder at anything they do. Yes, they're all married as far as I know, that is. They live together as man and wife, though they're not very particular, certainly about the ceremony. 
The fact is, a regular dustman don't understand much about such matters, and I believe don't care much either. From all I could learn on this subject, it would appear that, for one dustman that is married, twenty live with women, but remain constant to them. Indeed, both men and women abide faithfully by each other, and for this reason, the woman earns nearly half as much as the man. If the men and women were careful and prudent, they might, I am assured, live well and comfortable, but by far the greater portion of the earnings of both go to the publican, for I am informed on competent authority that a dustman will not think of sitting down for a spree without his woman. Among the dustmen there is no society, nor benefit club, specially devoted to the class, no provident institution whence they can obtain relief in the event of sickness or accident. The consequence is that, when ill or injured, they are obliged to obtain letters of admission to some of the hospitals, and there they remain till cured. In cases of total incapacity for labour, their invariable refuge is the workhouse. Indeed, they look forward whenever they foresee at all, to this asylum as their resting place in old age, with the greatest equanimity, and talk of it as the house, par excellence, or as the big house, the great house, or the old house. There are, however, scattered about in every part of London numerous benefit clubs made up of working men of every description, such as old friends, odd fellows, foresters, and Birmingham societies, and with some one or other of these the better class of dustmen are connected. The general rule, however, is that the men engaged in this trade belong to no benefit club whatever, and that in the season of their adversity they are utterly unprovided for, and consequently become burdens to the parishes wherein they happen to reside. I visited a large dust yard at the east end of London for the purpose of getting a statement from one of the men. My informant was, at the time of my visit, shoveling the sifted soil from one of the lesser heaps, and, by a great effort of strength and activity, pitching each shovelful to the top of a lofty mound, somewhat resembling a pyramid. Opposite to him stood a little woman, stoutly made, and with her arms bare above the elbow. She was his partner in the work, and was pitching shovelful for shovelful with him to the summit of the heap. She wore an old soiled cotton gown, open in front and tucked up behind, in the fashion of the last century. She had clouts of old rags tied around her ankles to prevent the dust from getting into her shoes, a sort of coarse towel fastened in front for an apron, and a red handkerchief bound tightly round her head. In this trim she worked away, and not only kept pace with the man, but often threw two shovels for his one, although he was a tall, powerful fellow. She smiled when she saw me noticing her, and seemed to continue her work with greater assiduity. I learned that she was deaf, and spoke so indistinctly that no stranger could understand her. She had also a defect in her sight, which latter circumstance had compelled her to abandon the sifting, as she could not well distinguish the various articles found in the dust heap. The poor creature had therefore taken to the shovel, and now works with it every day, doing the labour of the strongest men. From the man referred to, I obtained the following statement. Father was a dusty, was out all his life, and grandfather before him, for I can't tell how long. Father was always a rummin, such a beggar for lush. Why, I'm blowed if he wouldn't lush as much as half a dozen of them can lush now. Somehow the dusties hasn't got the stuff in them as they used to have. A few years ago, the fellas you'd think nothing are lushing away for five or six days without never going near their home. I never was at school in all my life. I don't know what it's good for. Maybe very well for the likes of you, but I doesn't know if it'd do a dusty any good. You see, when I'm not out with the cart, I digs here all day, and perhaps I'm up all night, and digs away again the next day. What does I care for reading, or anything of that there kind? When I gets home after me work, I tell you what I likes, though. Why, I just likes two or three pipes of backer, and a pot or two of good heavy and a song. And then I tumbles in with my sail, and I'm as happy as here and there one. That there sail of mine's a stunner, a regular stunner. There ain't never a woman can sift a heap quicker and my sail. Oh, sometimes she yarns as much as I does. The only thing is, she's such a beggar for lush, that there sail of mine, and then she kicks up such jolly rows, you'd never see the like in your life.
that there's the only fault as I know on in Sal, but barring that, she's an out and outer, and we're half a dozen of other sifters. Pick em out where you likes. No, we ain't married exactly, though it's all one for all that. I sticks to Sal, and Sal sticks to I, and there's an end on it. What is it to anyone? I recollect, sir, picking the rags and things out of Mother's sieve when I was a young'un, and putting them all in an heap just as it might be there. I was always in a dust yard. I don't think I could do no how in no other place. You see, I, I wouldn't be happy. Lark, I only knows how to work at the dust, cause I'm used to it, and so was father before me, and I'll stick to it as long as I can. A yearns about half a bull. Two shillings, six pence. A day, take one day with another. Sal sometimes yearns as much, and when I goes out at night, I yearns a bob or two more, and so I gets along pretty tidy, sometimes yearning more and sometimes yearning less. I never was sick as I knows on. I've been queerish of a morning a good many times, but I doesn't call that sickness. It's only the lush and nothing more. The smell's nothing at all when you get used to it. Lord bless you, you'd think nothing of it in a week's time. No, no more nor I do. There's a twenty of us works here, regular. I don't think there's one of them except Scratchy Jack can read. But he can do it stunning. He's out with the cart now, but Easter chappers can patter to you as long as he likes. In one dust yard I visited, there were fourteen people busily employed. Six of these were women, who were occupied in sifting, and were attended by three men, who shoveled the dust into their sieves, and the foreman, who was hard at work loosening and dragging down the dust from the heap, ready for the fiddlers in. Besides these, there were two carts and four men engaged in conveying the sifted dust to the barges alongside the wharf. At a larger dust yard that formerly stood on the banks of the Regent's Canal, I am informed that there were sometimes as many as 127 people at work. It is but a small yard which has not 30 to 40 labourers connected with it, and the lesser dust yards have generally from four to eight sifters and six or seven carts. There are, therefore, employed in a medium-sized yard, twelve collectors or cartmen, six sifters, and three fillers in besides the foreman or forewoman, making altogether twenty-two persons, so that, computing the contractors at ninety, and allowing twenty men to be employed by each, there would be eighteen hundred men thus occupied in the metropolis, which appears to be very near the truth. The dust collected is used for two purposes, one, as a manure for land of a peculiar quality, and two, for making bricks, the fine portion of the house dust called soil, and separated from the breeze, or coarser portion, used in brick-making, by sifting, is found to be peculiarly fitted for what is called breaking up a marshy healthy soil at its first cultivation. But during the operation of sifting the dust, many things are found which are useless for either manure or brick-making, such as oyster shells, old bricks, old boots and shoes, old tin kettles, old rags and bones, etc. These are turned into an honest penny, and used for various purposes. The bricks, etc., are sold for sinking beneath foundations, where a thick layer of concrete is spread over them. Many old bricks, too, are used in making new roads, especially where the land is low and marshy. The old tin goes to form the japanned fastenings of the corners of trunks as well as to other persons who remanufacture it into a variety of articles. The old shoes are sold to the London shoemakers, who use them as stuffing between the insole and the outer one, but by far the greater quantity is sold to the manufacturers of Prussian blue, that substance being formed out of refuse animal matter. The rags and bones are of course disposed of at the usual places, the marine store shops. The dust yards, or places where the dust is collected and sifted, are generally situated in the suburbs, and they may be found all round London, sometimes occupying open spaces adjoining back streets and lanes, and surrounded by the low, mean houses of the poor. Frequently, however, they cover a large extent of ground in the fields, and there the dust is piled up to a great height in a conical heap, and having much the appearance of a volcanic mountain. The reason why the dust heaps are confined principally to the suburbs is that more space is to be found in the outskirts than in a thickly peopled and central locality. 
Moreover, the fear of indictments for nuisance has had considerable influence in the matter, for it was not unusual for the yards in former times to be located within the boundaries of the city. They are now, however, scattered round London, and always placed as near as possible to the river, or to some canal communicating therewith. In St. George's, Shadwell, Ratcliffe, Limehouse, Poplar, and Black Wall, on the north side of the Thames, and in Redriff, Bermondsey, and Rotherhithe, on the south, they are to be found near the Thames. The object of this is that by far the greater quantity of the soil or ashes is conveyed in sailing barges, holding from seventy to one hundred tons each, to Faversham, Sittingbourne, and other places in Kent, which are the great brick-making manufactories for London. These barges come up invariably loaded with bricks, and take home in return a cargo of soil. Other dust-yards are situated contiguous to the Regents and the Surrey Canal, and for the same reason as stated, for the convenience of water carriage. Moreover, adjoining the Limehouse Cut, which is a branch of the Lee River, other dust yards may be found, and again travelling to the opposite end of the metropolis, we discover them not only at Paddington on the banks of the canal, but at Maiden Lane, in a similar position. A visit to any of the large metropolitan dust yards is far from uninteresting. Near the centre of the yard rises the highest heap, composed of what is called the soil, or finer portion of the dust used for manure. Around this heap are numerous lesser heaps, consisting of the mixed dust and rubbish carted in and shot down previous to sifting. Among these heaps are many women and old men, with sieves made of iron, all busily engaged in separating the breeze from the soil. There is likewise another large heap in some other part of the yard, composed of the cinders or breeze, waiting to be shipped off to the brickfields. The whole yard seems alive some sifting and others shoveling the sifted soil onto the heap, while every now and then the dust carts return to discharge their loads and proceed again on their rounds for a fresh supply. Cocks and hens keep up a continual scratching and cackling among the heaps, and numerous pigs seem to find great delight in rooting incessantly about after the garbage and offal collected from the houses and markets. The labourers comprise sifters, who are generally women, and mostly the wives or concubines of the dustmen, but sometimes the wives of badly paid labourers, fillers in, or shovelers of dust into the sieves of the sifters, one man being allowed to every two or three women, and carriers off of bones, rags, metal, and other perquisites to the various heaps. These are mostly children of the dustmen. The children, as soon as they are able to go into the yard, help their mothers in picking out the rags, bones, etc. from the sieve and in putting them in the basket. They are never sent to school, and as soon as they are sufficiently strong are mostly employed in some capacity or other by the contractor, and in due time become dustmen themselves. Some of the children, in the neighbourhood of the river, are mudlarks, and others are bone-grubbers and rag-gatherers, on a small scale, neglected and thrown on their own resources at an early age. Without any but the most depraved to guide them, it is no wonder to find that many of them turn thieves. To this state of the case, there are, however, some few exceptions. In a dust yard lately visited, the sifters formed a curious sight. They were almost up to their middle in dust, ranged in a semicircle in front of that part of the heap which was being worked. Each had before her a small mound of soil which had fallen through her sieve and formed a sort of embankment behind which she stood. The appearance of the entire group at their work was most peculiar. Their coarse, dirty cotton gowns were tucked up behind them, their arms were bared above their elbows, their black bonnets crushed and battered like those of fishwomen, over their gowns they wore a strong leather apron, extending from their necks to the extremities of their petticoats, while over this, again, was another leather apron, shorter, thickly padded, and fastened by a stout string or strap round the waist. In the process of their work they pushed the sieve from them and drew it back again with apparent violence, striking it against the outer leather apron with such force that it produced each time a hollow sound like a blow on the tenor drum. All the women present were middle-aged, with the exception of one who was very old, sixty-eight years of age, she told me, and had been at the business from a girl. She was the daughter of a dustman, the wife or woman of a dustman, and the mother of several young dustmen. 
sons and grandsons, all at work at the dust yards at the east end of the metropolis. The sifters are paid one shilling per day when employed, but the employment is not constant. The work cannot be pursued in wet weather, and the services of the sifters are required only when a large heap has accumulated. As they can sift much faster than the dust can be collected, the employment is therefore precarious. The payment has not, for the last thirty years at least, been more than one shilling per day. But the perquisites were greater. They formerly were allowed one half of whatever was found. Of late years, however, the hillman has gradually reduced the perquisites. First one thing and then another, until the only one they have now remaining is half of whatever money or other valuable article may be found in the process of sifting. These valuables the sifters often pocket, if able to do so unperceived. But if discovered in the attempt, they are immediately discharged. The fillers in, or shovelers of dust, into the sieves of sifters, are in general any poor fellows who may be straggling about in search of employment. They are sometimes, however, the grown-up boys of dustmen, not yet permanently engaged by the contractor. These are paid two shillings per day for their labour, but they are considered more as casualty men, though it often happens, if hands are wanted, that they are regularly engaged by the contractors and become regular dustmen for the remainder of their lives. The little fellows, the children of the dustmen, who follow their mothers to the yard and help them to pick rags, bones, etc., out of the sieve and put them into the baskets. As soon as they are able to carry a basket between two of them to the separate heaps, are paid three pence or four pence per day for this work by the hillman. The usual hours of labour vary according to the mode of payment. The collectors, or men out with the cart, being paid by the load, work as long as the light lasts. The fillers in, and sifters, on the other hand, being paid by the day, work the ordinary hours, from six to six, with the regular intervals for meals. The summer is the worst time for all hands, for then the dust decreases in quantity. The collectors, however, make up for the slackness at this period by night work, and being paid by the piece or load at the dust business, are not discharged when their employment is less brisk. No longer is the dustman's bell heard on the streets of London in anticipation of the fetid smell of his cart drawing near. No more do you hear the cry, Dustoye! from your window. The ash is gone. The rubbish remains, more than ever Mayhew could have predicted, and there would still be mountainous heaps if it wasn't removed to gargantuan landfills far from our eyes. There is no ash that the poor, out of necessity of paying for food and lodgings, are forced to pick through in modern Britain, but scavenging hasn't disappeared as a way of life for many experiencing poverty in our world today.